Taylor Decker's on my all 22 fantasy team. Stop. They don't care. So the strategic component to this game is through the roof. Your predictions, right? Your forecasting in fantasy football into how good is this player? This is gonna, it's gonna change the industry. Yeah. yeah. I moved to the old town where it goes down. Look at me now. I wrote my goals down. I hold it down. Made myself proud. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the All 22 podcast. Uh, everybody, we are live for signups. I don't know if you're aware. I don't know if we've said it enough, but we are live for signups. You can use promo code Second Season. That's the number two ND season for twenty dollars off of the first year of your All 22 membership. So if you haven't yet, get in there and sign up. We have about three more weeks for you to sign up and get into drafts, and we want you to get in there. So do it as soon as possible. And Ray, dude, how are you, man? We just had the expo. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. I'm rested, excited, sore but all around feeling awesome. It was a great time. Bob Long puts on a show. He's a great guy, great dude, great event, great weekend. It should be, I said it last episode, it should be on every f- football fan's bucket list. Oh, for sure. And it's like, right, it was only year four, I think, of the Expo. We've gone the last two years. Uh, and I think like probably three, four years from now, we're going to be talking about this like Comic-Con, right? Like millions of people go to Comic-Con. I think in a few years, like there's going to be that kind of turnout to the Expo. Yeah, hundred percent. So, get in early if you haven't yet. Don't wait any longer. Twenty twenty four will be here before you know it, and yeah, that's a scary sure. sentence. And and they're doing more and more, right? Like, and I mean, this year the big story was like Des was there, um, so we got to meet Des, right? That was super cool. We actually got to play football against Des, which was even cooler. And you know he's a good guy because he didn't play receiver; he played quarterback. So shout out to Des for not going out there and playing receiver versus all of us. But it was a lot of fun, and uh, I, I think you have to. You had to have been there to believe what happened. So like, I'm not even going to tell the story. Yeah, it's it's just, it's it's one of those just special events in human history. If you were there, you know what we're talking about. If if you weren't, I'm sorry. You know, that that's why you got to go next year because I'm sure something else that's just special and will, you know, go down in the annals of history will also take place. So you just had to be there. But uh, yeah, it went down. Yeah, and if you were there, you probably got some awesome free All-22 t-shirts you probably got, you know, a discounted membership that we can't even tell people about, but it was awesome. So, you know, make it out there. You get a lot of cool stuff. You get to lot, meet a lot of cool people. I feel like, you know, we, we hung out so much with like Steve, AJ, and Andrew from the Fantasy Guides. Like those guys are awesome. Loved hanging out with them. Uh, Marcus from NFL and uh, Gary, our boy Gary. Like what a good time we had with him. Like <laughs> just, just Gary. Just Whenever he says time. his name, you just, if you know just Gary, Gary, you know who we're talking about. Yeah. 100%. All right, the next thing, Hard Knock started. So I don't know. Have you seen an episode yet? I still have not. I'm still in the same struggle bus as last episode where it's like, okay, I got to fit everything into this window, okay, before (laughs) the season actually starts. But then people keep planning things around my open days of, like, life, and and I can't get to it. So it's like like tonight, would I love to watch Hard Knocks? Yeah, there's also football on tonight. So I got to fit it in somewhere. Not only just hard knocks, but also, you know, now it's just a sort of a, a marathon keeping up with Aaron Rodgers' sort of Instagram stunts involving David Bakhtiari and all that fun stuff. He's always up to something mischievous. So, uh, yeah, I'm just adding it to the list. But apparently it's 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 quite the uh, it's quite the start to the season. Yeah, it was a good first episode for sure. And I mean, there's a ton of personalities, right? You got I mean, Rodgers to start, but then you have Garrett Wilson and like Sauce Gardner and Quinn and Williams like. It's a fun group. It's a fun group of guys. They definitely uh, fit into the TV personality that Hard Knocks is looking for. So question. So have they yet identified, like they have in every season of Hard Knocks, that one guy who's from like Western Chippewa State, like the ninth receiver on the depth chart that's not going to make the team, but you know they, they play like the soft music like in the background whenever they interview him as like the try hard guy, like everyone's rooting for him to make the team, but everyone Malcolm knows there's Rodriguez absolutely no shot. No, you know, he's a, he's a baller. Malcolm Rodriguez is legit. I'm talking like this guy has no shot. He's going to oh, be okay. like, you know, in a warehouse next year, like telling people that he was on HBO hard knocks or max hard knocks, whatever it's called now. Right. Like have they mm-hmm. identified that guy yet or no? Not in really not well. episode one. Episode one was like really highlighting the big stars on offense. And a little bit sauce gardener. Uh, mm-hmm. but there I I've been seeing like highlights from practice, and there's a receiver the Jets have that's been like blowing up. So might be that guy. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll keep it in mind. But Don't dude, the Rogers thing me. is interesting. 
the Rodgers thing is interesting, right? Because rumor now is that he took that pay cut, not just to get Dalvin Cook, but so that they can go and trade for Bakhtiari or and or Devontae Adams. As a Packer fan, I would absolutely hate them taking Bakhtiari away because I want that offensive lineman for Jordan Love. But if we got like decent pick for it. Yeah, but but uh, that's not happening. I think that's just Rodgers having fun. Like, first off, you're the Packers. You're not just gonna, you're not just gonna hand him. Yeah, oh yeah, you're in Rodgers. Cool. It's funny. Ha ha. Here's David Bakhtiari. Like, no, you got to give me some legit value. I don't think the Jets are gonna do that. I think they're fine. I mean, Beckton, assuming he's healthy, right? Um, they have talented offensive line there. If they could just finally stay healthy for one full season, I wouldn't even do it if I was the Jets either. Like. You know, thanks, Rogers, but uh, roll out with what you got. What about a disgruntled Devontae Adams, though, right? Like, what if he just says, like, yeah, I'm not playing for the Raiders this year? I wouldn't play for the Raiders this year if I was him. I would just say, like, my back hurts and collect money and that's it. But uh, sure, sure. I mean, but you have you have Garrett Wilson. I, I don't know. He's Sure, go get Devontae Adams if he's available. I, I, if I were the Raiders, I would make that move because why not? I mean, you're not going anywhere this year. But I, you want to you want to invest in an environment around Aiden O'Connell. I'm sure we're going to talk about him later. But uh, no, you know, it's, get rid of Devontae Adams. That type of player does not need to be on your team right now. He helps no one. Yeah, it helps nobody by keeping Devontae Adams in Vegas. And I have no I idea the cap implications of this, but the guy's got one or two years left. You're not going anywhere for like three or four. Get what, get something for him. They actually paid him a lot, so it might be it might be tough. But I would love to see it happen. I think it could happen. But let's let's get into week one, right? Preseason week one was here. Super exciting. And there's a bunch of guys I want to highlight. We'll just kind of go back and forth. We'll talk about the guys that we want to talk about. But of course, first, I'm going to talk about Jack Campbell. Captain Jack Campbell for the Lions, who was PFF's highest graded player in week one. Rookie in week one, over a 90 grade. So I'm thinking about starting my victory lap now, but I'll, I'll hold off a little bit longer. But in all honesty, he looked great, right? He's already asked to be the uh, play caller for that defense. You see you see him on multiple plays, calling out shifts, moving defensive linemen around. So for him to be able to do that after such a short time in that defense, I think is, is great, right? That's a huge thing for him. But then with his play, he looked super instinctual, something that we saw a lot of at Iowa, uh, a lot of instinct. Uh, you know, hitting the hole fast, meeting uh, running backs, you know, at the uh, outside the tackles, being able to get there, uh, follow his pursuit. There were a couple plays where he over pursued, but, you know, I think all in all, it was a really great showing for him. You're putting a lot of stock in uh, preseason week one, huh? For a rookie linebacker? Hell yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, he did. He looked, he looked good. He looked good. I've never fully disagreed with you on Jack Campbell. I just, uh, you know, tap the brakes a little bit. It's a good start. It's what you want to see. I mean, pretty sure you called him Leighton Van Der Esch, if I remember correctly. Leighton Van Der Esch is a good player. He's a good player with just neck issues, who could mm-hmm. be a very good player if he didn't have those issues in the league. But um, the, the the thing with Jack Campbell has always just been, hey, with with that pick in the first round, he has he has to be that top notch player in order to make it worth it because the opportunity cost at some higher value positions. Uh, that were available to you is just so great. So he's got to he's got to keep it up. It's a good start. It's a great start, but he's he's got to keep that up. If he does the typical linebacker thing, where you know uh, next week is a sixty-two, and and you know you kind of you end the year in the high seventies, maybe even low eighties, which is very good. But you're not getting top level play week to week. You, you, if he doesn't become Fred Warner, that's that's the issue with the Lions is the opportunity cost with that pick. But for all 22, when pretty much everybody is in need of linebackers, heck yeah, it's a great start. I mean, that's a really good transition because there's two players on my list of next guys to talk about that were there for the Lions if they wanted them. And that's Jordan Addison and Emmanuel Forbes. And both guys had great showings in their first game. Uh, Addison had this like amazing toe drag catch. Um but it was called incomplete. The ref made a terrible call. Um, And he had a few other routes that looked great and a few other catches. So really excited for Jordan Addison and then Forbes, right? The huge knock on him was that he's super skinny, right? And you and I sat here and I think Bobby too, and said, I don't really care. I care nothing about that. There was a goal line tackle that Emmanuel Forbes had uh, running back, tries to hit the, um, the, the hole outside the tackle, 
uh, and Forbes came down and just closed on it and made a great play, like right in the backfield to stop the touchdown. Right. And like, that's not a play that a lot of, what is he like 170 pound corners can make. Uh, but he is that guy. Like he's that instinctual guy that I think, you know, he's not going to have a problem with this stuff. No, he's just good at football and it's not 2003 anymore where you want, you know, five eleven, but 198 pounds at corner. It's just, it's just a different game. He's built for this game. And then if he's making goal line tackles on top of that, that's really good. I mean, it, the, the, the tackle itself was a little bit, uh, you know, overhype in the sense that he also had a defender kind of squared up on the ball carrier. So the impact, it looked as if it was all Forbes when it really wasn't, but he did his job and he did, he did his, his job, job well, well on a physical play. Yep, yes. exactly. So, hey, that was our that was our cornerback one, right? So mm -hmm. there you have it, folks. Yeah. We won I mean, preseason. That's all we needed to see. We're good. That's it. We won, right? Like those we three won. guys, we won already. But no, my other guy, Deuce Vaughn, is the next guy I want to talk about, right, for the Cowboys. Another guy that was kind of a size concern, right? And he goes out there and he is absolutely electric. He was putting, you know, Jags defenders in a blender. He was making play after play. It's a few plays, right? That spin play where he made the, uh, the edge rusher had him in the backfield. I think it was an edge rusher and he just absolutely made the guy look ridiculous. Uh, yeah, he's probably going against second, third string guys, but I don't know, man. I don't know. I think he's a special player. Yeah, we talked about how in all 22, this could be a very valuable player if he carves up a big enough role for himself in Dallas. He's not, he's not a standard, you know, hand the ball off 15 times a game ball carrier. That's not what he was drafted for. That's not what he would be used for. And because of that in standard fantasy, he may not, he might not be very valuable, but in all 22, right. Similar to probably what the Cowboys are going to do with him this season. He could play a big role for you as the second running back. Who's just there to make plays, uh, you know, catch the ball out of the backfield uh, again, make people miss in space. They have a role for him. They have a plan for him. And I mean, he's showing up and showing out. He's been doing it all training camp. They're super excited about him. So a lot of people have been looking at, uh, you know, Malik Davis uh, and Rico Dowdle behind Tony Pollard to say, if anything were to happen to Tony Pollard, that, you know, one of these guys will step up and be the man. But the guy you might want to own outside of Tony Pollard in the Dallas backfield is probably Deuce Vaughn because he's a heck of a player who's going to have a role on this team and do it very well. Right. And besides that, you know, if you're looking at it from a dynasty standpoint, Pollard is on the franchise tag, right? So if Dallas says next year that Deuce is their guy, it could happen. And no, I don't think Deuce is ever going to be kind of like that, like you were talking about, right? Like a 30 carry a game guy. I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, who knows if they decide, you know, we'll just get another guy next year's draft and then we'll spell him with Deuce Vaughn and Vaughn ends up with like 15 or 16 really valuable carries next year. So I'm excited about him. And then I want to talk about Paris Johnson, who I know is really like your guy, right? And I thought he had some nice reps. Like he looked he looked good. There was some rough stuff in there. One of the things I like about Paris Johnson from college is in his film, there's a lot of that plays within his frame, knows his strength, doesn't get out of control a lot. And I saw him getting out of control a little bit on some plays, but there were some promising things. I don't know if you saw, there was a few pass sets where, uh, you know, he he squares up his, his uh, edge rusher coming at him gets his hands on him and holds him long enough where the rest of the offensive line is kind of falling apart and the quarterback gets to kind of step behind Paris Johnson and make his play. I think one of the plays he ended up throwing it, throwing it to a receiver. And then the other play, he actually ran outside of uh, Paris Johnson's hip, which you like to see, right? He's the quarterbacks are already knowing if I need to get protected, go stand behind Paris Johnson. So I think that's a pretty good start for a rookie offensive tackle. Yeah. And one of my main things about, especially week one of the preseason, right? Is I don't put too much stock into the the graded performance so much as did you flash some type of unique ability, right? At the end of the day, these are rookies honestly playing their first live NFL action. There's going to be mistakes, uh, especially when you're talking about offensive linemen, uh, the cohesiveness that's needed there uh, across the offensive line is just not going to be there for a rookie or just a line in general in week one of the preseason. And what I think is interesting about Paris Johnson is he he had a high pass blocking grade, graded 68. Uh, he had, I think, 10 pass blocking snaps, gave up one hurry, uh, was solid the rest of the snaps there. And the run blocking grade is really what, what drove his grade down. And a lot of that is because 
especially with run blocking, you're working in tandem with the tight end next to you or the guard to the other side of you, uh, working up to the second level. There's more moving parts involved, whereas sometimes if you're pass blocking, you're just on an island and and you got to block your guy, right? And so that natural natural ability shines through more in those pass blocking sets and situations where Paris uh, Paris Johnson, not Campbell, um, sh- you know, just really performed well. Again, it's week one. Kind of that situation you described is probably what it's going to be like all year, right? Paris Johnson is the most talented guy on that line, so there's going to be a lot of things crumbling around him. Um, but it's a good start and a good showing for someone who, again, was on the left side at Ohio State, but lined up at right tackle uh, so far this preseason. So that's another adjustment that he's making, too, on the fly this offseason. So if he performs well with all those sort of moving parts and the changes that he's had to deal with, I think that's a very good sign moving forward if he's still able to hold his own this early. Yeah, and I think that was a lot of what I saw about like the issues I saw with his frame because he didn't have those in college, right? But it could be that move from left to right tackle, which is causing that. And uh, I, you know, I think there's probably a pretty good chance. But we saw that with Tristan Wirfs, right, a few years ago. The pre or Penny Sewell, excuse me, Penny Sewell, a few years ago, they were saying in preseason he looked terrible, right? It's really just an adjustment period for guys as talented as this. They will figure it out, but you're gonna sweat it out a little bit in the off season when you see those adjustments on film. It's a little tough to watch, but he will get it together. Let's go to you called it before, right? The quarterbacks that uh, really impressed, and the three names that impressed me most are the three names I wouldn't have expected, right? Aiden O'Connell, DTR, and Malik Cunningham, I think were the three guys that everybody was like chatting about and hyped up about. O'Connell in general, right? He he played incredibly well uh, and he really stood out amongst the group. He was making throw after throw, looked sharp, looked accurate. But the one thing that surprised me was the power that he had in his arm. There's a few like simple routes where the um, the receiver, say, makes an in-cut and he just fires the ball to the receiver. And a few times he threw it so hard that you actually see the receiver not like falling down from impact, but falling down because they had to make sure that they like had the catch and they couldn't just like catch and keep going. I think that's a little bit of a problem, right? You want your receiver to be able to catch the ball and keep going. But it was impressive. Like dude has a cannon and I did not know that about him. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I mean, and it's funny because you don't really, you didn't really see that at, at Purdue with, with O'Connell and perhaps that's partially why he's was in college. So he was almost 25 years old, but um, yeah, he, he stepped up. He performed very well. Again, like I mentioned, it is week one of the preseason. You don't want to, you know, over hype it too much other than, Hey, it's, it's a good start. And that position in Vegas is, is open as far as I'm concerned. I mean, if Jimmy Garoppolo is what's standing in your way, then that's, that's an open competition as far as I'm concerned. So if he could keep it up, that might be something where, Oh, look at that. If I need a quarterback, maybe I'm grabbing O'Connell out of Vegas and not uh, Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, Low key. That's a really interesting story that not a lot of people are talking about and they probably should. hundred percent. I think there's a real opportunity there. And I mean, we all know Jimmy G is going to miss games, right? Like Jimmy G is going to miss games. So even, even if O'Connell doesn't get the job from week one, there's going to be a point in the season where O'Connell is playing football. And if he looks good, you're really going to tell me that, you know, the Raiders are going to be in this winning situation where they're playoff bound and they're going to be like, no, we need Jimmy G in there. Like, no, absolutely not. They're going to be, two and eight, and they're going to be like, okay, O'Connell, the, the rest of the year is yours. So I think he definitely has an opportunity to prove himself. But I don't know if we're jumping the gun saying that DTR could be a legitimate threat, right? Now we've seen him in two games. Yes, it's not a lot of throws. I think we're going to see him tonight again, right? And I think he's getting the start tonight. But he's a guy that's looked incredible, right? Like he's making big plays. He's making big throws. He's using his legs in a way that like, I'm not sure everybody knew he could. So like, Super exciting that there's this guy on the Browns that, because you know, like my hatred for what, how the Browns kind of like built their team, that could be threatening. Could be Relax. threatening. He could be threatening. He's not threatening. He, there's like fully guaranteed, like quarter of a billion dollar reasons why he's not threatening uh, <laughs> to take anything away from anybody. Um, yeah, he he looks good. I mean, that's 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 a Bobby call right there. That was all twenty two Bobby's yeah. favorite quarterback, and he's a gamer. I think that's just the best way to describe him. He's a gamer, right? It's not necessarily about wow arm strength or the mobility. Yes, it's just some guys are just gamers. They're not super polished. They're not, um, you know, just pinpoint precision type passers. But 
they're accurate. They get the ball out quickly. They get the ball out in the right spot, and they can make plays happen, and they have a good feel for the game, which especially that last part is the most important part of playing quarterback. I say it over and over again. It's that pocket presence first and foremost, and some guys just have that feel. And while you know DTR might not have the high-end talent of someone like a Deshaun Watson, he's got a feel for the game and that's going to keep him employed for a long time. And maybe he's one of those guys that bounces around here or there and finds himself starting uh, at quarterback for a team at some point in his career. And perhaps for a few years, because he, he just has that, that feel, that innate feel and not a lot of guys have it. By the time people are listening to this, we might look like idiots, right? Because DTR might have a terrible game and they're gonna be like, Oh, well, there goes that. But it's interesting because that quarterback room is pretty deep, right? The Browns went out and signed Joshua Dobbs, who had gotten some starts last year, right? And had basically earned that backup spot in Cleveland. They also had Kellen Mond. So they have a bunch of very intriguing guys behind Watson. And I doubt they're going to run into the season with four quarterbacks, right? So there's a chance, you know, a lot of teams only go in there with two. There's a chance they carry three. Uh, but DTR, you know, has to beat out some really talented guys to earn a spot on this roster in general. Right. And I think he's doing that. Uh, but what about Malik, Malik Cunningham, who rumors are he got reps with the first team this week, right? Like, so he is legitimately getting practice, uh, reps with the first team. No, I don't have any context. Maybe like, you know, Mac Jones was visiting his family on a day or something, but like, I don't know. It's interesting to follow. I think that's just... It's just something that like Belichick would do. I'm not putting too much stock into that yet. Yeah, Millie Cunningham was excited. I mean, but Belichick's that like super old school in the sense of that could be motivation. That could just be, hey, this guy played well, so I'm going to put him in the starter, see what we got, which is good. You never know what could happen at that point, but I'm not putting much stock into something like that quite yet. If, if someone were taking a dart and throwing it at a board here, say it's the 52nd or third round of a startup draft here in the last couple of weeks before we start the season, and they're just saying, I'm going to take one of these young quarterbacks that is, you know, is not a starter, but maybe could be something. And they're looking at a, a DTR. They're looking at a Malik Cunningham. They're looking at an Aiden O'Connell. I think I would have Cunningham third on that list still and maybe throw the dart at one of those other two. But, um, you know, Belichick has done crazier things. So just, just something to stow away and, you know, he's going to be on waivers, I would think, more so than not. So just something to keep in mind. But I'm not I'm not putting the cart any further than that right now. Yeah, no, I agree with you. But let's get into the top three quarterbacks and talk about them. And maybe there's not a ton to talk about, right? So Bryce Young did get the start for the Panthers. Literally only had, I think, six passes, right? And his first pass looked good, right? He uh, went through a progression, hit Thielen on a, uh, on a route, you know, decent gain. I think it was like a 10 or 12-yard gain. Uh, so, like, you love to see that, but they didn't really give him a, that much of an opportunity to make an impact on the game. Uh, any any reason why they would give him such a short leash? Uh, maybe because everything else around him is just so bad. <laughs> He's so unquestionably the guy that they're just treating him as such. That's the only thing I can think of. You want to get your rookie some burn, but um, the environment's not great. So if if he's not playing extensively with the ones and you want to get your ones out of there, you might just have to put him in with that group because that's not a deep team. That environment's probably not good for him beyond those starters. And maybe they think it does more harm than good. I, I don't know. I mean, he didn't look overwhelmed. Uh, like maybe some of the other quarterbacks we might talk about in a second here, um, which is just his game. That is Bryce Young's game. So We've talked about him a pretty decent amount in previous episodes and not much to get into here other than the fact that it's good to see that he did not look overwhelmed. The game did not look too big for him. It was just a very short sample size to actually work off of. You had to call it a short sample size, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Why did you put, why did you point that out? I wasn't, Oh my God. It sounded on purpose. It sounded on purpose. Let's go to Stroud who again, didn't have a long leash at all. I think he only got four throws and, um, you know, we, we all kind of saw what happened, right? There was one throw where he, like at Ohio State, would kind of stare down a receiver. He knew which guy he was going to the whole time, made a throw. The route was actually a sick route by, uh, by Dell, um, but he makes the throw at, anyway. Safety comes down, intercepts the ball, and that was really it for him. I think, you know, I, the only thing I'll say is I never like to end a guy's game that way, right? Like that was the beginning of the game. 
I know they probably went in there saying you're going to play one series and that was his one series. But like you, you, you want a guy to end with a little success, right? And I know this week he's probably just been hungry to get back on the field and prove himself. But I would have liked to just kind of give him another opportunity there. What do you think? I think that's psychological. Let him just stew on that. He knows how poorly he played. The game did look too big for him, which again, it's week one. I'm not saying the game was too big for CJ Stroud. I'm just saying in week one, he looked overwhelmed, which again, not terribly unexpected. It's week one of the preseason for these rookies, the first NFL action. And at Ohio State, you're playing Madden on rookie mode, and that is just not the case in the NFL. So it's going to be a big adjustment. It was a big adjustment. And it's kind of like that motivational thing with the head coach. Like, oh, yeah, no, that's it. You're done. We said you were going to get a series. You got a series. That's how it ended. Or two series, whatever it was. That's how it ended for you. You got to stew on that for a whole week and, you know, let it eat you up a little bit and you'll be better for it. I think that's all it is. Uh, My big thing in the preseason overall is just how do you look after kind of taking everything in, watching the film, getting a taste of game action, do you go back out there and make the same mistakes? Because that could be an indication of something. If you don't go out there and make the same mistakes, if you're a little more careful with the ball, um, you know, you don't take as much chances, that's fine. That's what we want to see. We want to see that bit of growth, right? And then as you get more comfortable again and you kind of mature, then then some of that, you know, gunslinger mentality, whatever you want to call it, starts to show itself again. It's kind of like that initial humbling uh, experience and then you kind of build from there. So, I'm not concerned with CJ Stroud just yet, but I am interested in seeing how he looks coming off of that in week two. Agreed. And now we got Anthony Richardson. I think he's probably the, you know, we have a larger sample size to talk about. And it was really a mixed review. And I'll start off by saying that I thought that his first game was going to be a lot worse than it was just because of the the rawness that we saw in his game from college. And what we did see in college was a lot of, accuracy issues and i think that came over quite a bit right so there was four throws in particular where he you know there was like an open receiver that he's trying to hit and the throw was just off right like it kind of reminded me of like cam newton from a couple years ago where you know you have an open receiver guy steps up to make a throw and you're you're missing him either outside high low something where the receiver's just not able to make a play right and we're talking about the best athletes in the world at receiver that can make crazy catches, right, and do it all the time. So for you to be able to put it in a place that's like outside of their catch radius means that you made a bad throw, right? And there were four throws in particular where he did that. And then there was the interception, right? So he's he's blitzed on the uh, RPO side that he's you know faking a handoff to, pulls it back, and kind of panics, right? He doesn't know what to do. Uh, and I think a more mature quarterback knows to probably throw that away. He doesn't. And instead he pump fakes a couple times and then throws it like essentially right to a defender, uh, which was a poor showing. One thing I did like is that there were a few plays later where he came back and kind of a similar thing happened and he did decide to throw it away. Right. So he, he started to panic a little bit, kind of, you know, got himself calm, threw it away. So that's kind of like the bad stuff. Is there any other bad stuff you want to talk about? No, I think the athleticism gives you, more margin for error than if you're just a standard quarterback back there, right? Anthony Richardson has the ability to extend the play enough to where he may freeze up initially and then kind of has the ability to compose himself and then make a proper read or throw away, whatever the case may be, get himself out of some trouble to then throw the ball away and live another down where other guys can't. So that is, that's very important or that's a very good tool to have in your toolbox as you develop as a young player the thing with him is just honestly, it the accuracy just has to get better. You can't miss that many throws in an NFL game, an NFL regular season game, let alone just the snippet of time you're in during a preseason game. That has to get better. The windows are going to get tighter uh, in the regular season, and you know against starters. And so you have to you have to nail that down. And that's not something that just fixes itself from August to October. That's this is more of a long term thing with Richardson, which I think is just the case for anybody that drafted him. Right. You're not trying to put him out there week one and say, this is my ultimate two starter and I'm going to ride with him and I think I'm going to make the playoffs. That's a long term play based on his upside, his his arm, his athleticism and everything else in between that has to come together to, you know, in order to become a complete player. It's not there yet, but the sum of the parts are there. They just have to be put together. So um, 
Yeah, I'm not necessarily encouraged or discouraged. It's about exactly what I would have expected. But you want to see some sort of improvement because what you saw is the accuracy concerns that you had coming into the league with him, and that has to get better. Yeah, but let's talk about the good things now. And that kind of reminds me of like a pool player. I don't know if you've ever played pool. If you're like not a good pool player, this might be you, right? Like you're playing pool and there's a shot where you have a straight line to hit the white ball into some other ball to get it into the pocket. It's a straight line. All you have to do is hit it straight and get it in and you will absolutely just muff it, right? Like you'll do a terrible job. You'll you'll hit the side. You'll end up hitting the eight ball and you lose the game. But there might be this like really crazy difficult shot where you have to go like around a ball to hit your ball, and get it into the hole. And like, the best throw of Anthony Richardson's night was this 45 year, yard uh, corner route to Alec Pierce, where Pierce is covered, right? And Anthony Richardson somehow fits the ball into his chest, gets it right there, and Pierce just can't make the catch, right? He just can't hold on to the ball. But it would have been a touchdown throw. That throw was incredible. And that's what it kind of reminds me of. It's right, like there's these easy layups right in front of you that Anthony Richardson was just kind of struggling with. But when he needed to make like a big throw, a big time throw, he really had no problem doing that. And there was another one that was a 20 yard in route over the middle and he cleared the ball over a linebacker and in between the linebacker and the safety where the receiver was running and he placed it perfectly. Right. And it's almost like, why are these like these really difficult throws that you're making them look easy where these very easy throws you're making look difficult. And I think that's just something with like, like you were talking about, like his athleticism, maybe he moves too quick. Maybe, that's kind of like his mind's racing and, you know, when it's something easy, he just doesn't do it right. But I think he needs to kind of find a happy medium there. Keep the big stuff, right? Obviously keep the big stuff, but you need to be able to do the little things well to be successful. Yeah, it's just it's just one of those deals, right? Um, Terrence Newman went like two full NFL seasons without giving up a touchdown and then like got destroyed by like Mike Fury when he was on the Detroit Lions. It's just one of those things like for some, for some reason, just the layups – can be difficult early on for some of these players and uh yeah terrence newman just caught astray but um my, my, my favorite player of all time but uh yeah it's one of those things that that's why you drafted richardson you saw why you drafted him but you saw why it's going to take time and so if he is starting out of the gate apparently in in indianapolis it's gonna be a roller coaster so you can't you know his play is going to be up and down. You cannot be up and down with it with your emotions as far as like tracking this thing week week to week. You have to take a step back and understand it's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride. And then you just hope that, you know, on the other side of this thing, year two, year three, the growth and maturation just starts to take place because, you know, it's not something that's just going to happen with time. It's not automatic. Just because it happened with someone like Josh Allen does not mean it's going to happen with someone like Anthony Richardson, but you have to take a step back and not get too caught up in the lows because they are coming. Yeah, for sure. And in the preseason, I typically don't give a lot of credence to the performance of like veterans because they're going against a lot of like lesser talent than they would have in a regular season. But very briefly, I think Derek Carr, I think Jordan Love, I think Baker Mayfield just kind of proved that they are, you know, they're ready for that, right? Like they're that next level player, right? Like everybody talks smack about Derek Carr, maybe rightfully so, but like, and Baker Mayfield, everybody talks smack about Baker Mayfield, but like when they, when you go and see them do what like CJ Stroud is struggling to do, or Anthony Richardson is struggling to do, and they make it look so damn easy. It just kind of shows you that like being a quarterback in the NFL is incredibly hard, number one, but number two, the, the veterans are veterans for a reason, right? And like the reason that they've gotten second and third contracts, right? Derek Carr and Baker Mayfield is because they are veteran quarterbacks, right? Jordan Love, I think it was very promising to see him do well, but he has been in the league for four years, right? So it's like, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but it is exciting and good to see. Wow, it really has been four years. That That is crazy. But yeah, the Kyle Trask talk was nonsense. This is Baker Mayfield's team over there in Tampa, and he's still better than a lot of people give him credit for. He should be a starter in this league. So I'm just going to leave Agreed. it at is there, is there any other veteran, though, that you wanted to touch on before we move on? Ah, no, not really. It's 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 preseason week one. I think we can get into uh, get into more meaty stuff. Cool. So only other thing I'll say: preseason week two starts tonight, and it's Browns versus Eagles. So I hope people are in there watching. You might be listening to this to tomorrow, so you'll be uh, maybe watching the highlights. But yeah, it should be fun to see. And again, like, what's DTR going to do to surprise us? We'll we'll have to wait and see. Let's jump into the hidden gems. Uh, and this week it's NFC West. I know I was supposed to have that ready last week, Ray, so I apologize. Let's do it this week. And uh, why don't you kick off the 49ers? 
Oh man, this is it's gonna be such an anticlimactic answer. It's just whoever the heck is the quarterback because of Kyle Shanahan. It's really ah. that simple. I mean, yeah, you shouldn't have started with them, you shouldn't have started with me. But I mean, we talked about, I think two episodes ago, about how um Kyle Shanahan's offense is basically the best in the league at simply producing yards, easy yards for his quarterback. Um, both uh, Brock Purdy and Jimmy Garoppolo were the league leaders in the NFL uh, in yards per attempt on zero graded throws, meaning any old replacement level player robot put in that position can make the throw to the open receiver based on the design of the play and what's available. And again, both of those players were best in the league in yards per attempt at that. That just shows you that that scheme is creating a lot of big plays for the quarterbacks and big, easy plays. So whoever starts is going to look good. And it, to me, it's really that simple. And when you go down the rest of the roster, it's such a strong roster from the inside out. There aren't many candidates to choose from as far as who's a sleeper, because a lot of them are established or, you know, high upside young players that aren't necessarily sleepers. Um, but just, you know, good players in a well-constructed roster. So I, I took the easy answer and just said, whoever the heck plays quarterback, they're going to do pretty well. Yeah. I feel like that's a given, right? I think that, you know, I don't knock you for saying it cause it's a good answer, but it's, it's easy. And, uh, the 49ers, right. They're one of the best coaches coach teams in the NFL. And I think that's when you find a lot of hidden gems and it's obvious that this is one of the best teams because, Last year, there was two of those guys, and I think it's Brock Purdy and Hufanga, Hufanga, and those guys did incredible. They kind of came out of nowhere. So I I expect the 49ers to have hidden gems every year. Like, I expect that to happen. Uh, The one guy that I thought was kind of interesting was their second-round pick from last year, Drake Jackson, because this dude essentially gets to play beside Nick Bosa, Jonathan Hargrave, and Eric Armstead, and then he has Fred Warner and Drake Greenlaw behind him, right? Like, is there an easier job in the NFL than, you know, we always joke about, like, whoever's lined up next to Aaron Donald, that's the easiest job in the NFL. But, like, this guy might have an easier job with the rest of the talent that's around him on that defense. Or Jalen Hurts. Yep. Or Jalen Hurts. Just just keep going. Just keep going. Yeah, I will. I will. I'm going (laughs) to ignore the Jalen Hurts slander and I'm going to keep going. Uh, But yeah, basically my point is, is he's going to have the best matchups every week, basically having one-on-one matchups every week. And one of my knocks on him as a prospect last year was that I wasn't sure he was really strong enough to be an NFL contributor on every play. Last year, he only got 15 to 20 snaps a game, but he did get some burn and he, he graded out about a 60. And when you watch his film, you still see a lot of that kind of lack of strength, but this is an athletic freak, right? This is a guy that has elite speed, elite bend, and athlete, elite athleticism in his play that should be able to help him at this level. And maybe it's not easy to win in double teams when you're being double teamed, but this guy's going to get so many one-on-one matchups that I think he's going to win a lot of them, right? And I think even last year in his limited snaps, he had four sacks, right? Like he had a few sacks. This year with the one-on-one matchups with his athleticism, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the number of hurries that he has like triples and the number of sacks he has triples, right? He gets to 10 or 12. I wouldn't be shocked at all. And then from a PFF grade perspective, you know, it's about winning, right? You're an edge rusher. It's about just beating the guy in front of you. It's a lot harder to do that when you're being double teamed, right? So it, you're, you're, you're likely to grade out more evenly if you're being double teamed and not able to win. But if you're one-on-one and you have this athleticism, I expect his grade to do a lot better. I could see him ending the year around 75 and being a really talented player in the league. Yeah, one of the things people have to keep in mind with Drake Jackson is he was a really young prospect. He turned 21 years old like two weeks before he was drafted. So it's a young player that's going to take time to get that sort of, you know, develop that game strength. And so it's still not quite there yet, but you're talking about someone who's probably would be in the middle, you know, 50th percentile or whatever age wise in this year's draft class who already has a year in the NFL under his belt. So you know, the, the, the bones are there for a great player and a great prospect. It's again, similar to what we said about some other players. It's about all of that just sort of coming together as he develops and matures. And, uh, yeah, he's got the environment around him to, you know, allow him to do that without having too much on his plate early on. For sure. All right. So hit us with the Cardinals. All right. So for the Cardinals, I have, (laughs) it's Isaiah Simmons. And it's a name that's really fallen off 
I'm pretty sure, I, I think it was you, might have been Bobby, but you can stand Isaiah Simmons in all 22 coming into the league because of all the different ways he was going to be used and they never allow him to get comfortable, right? So when you dig into Isaiah Simmons, who's been a, you know, kind of a lightning rod, right? He seems to be used more now at deep safety and he struggled against the run, but last year he had a pass rush grade in the 80s and a 69.9 coverage grade just throughout the course of the season, right? On a not so great defense. It's been a lot of trial and error early on in the league for him, but um, the Cardinals hired a new defensive coordinator. Uh, I think it's Nick Rollis from the Eagles. And when a new coach comes in, they will lie to the press and say, ah, oh, you know, I'm not, I haven't seen the tape of anybody and I'm just, you know, everybody's got a clean slate and they're going to come out here and practice and I'm going to see who earns their spot. That's, that's a lie. They watch tape on everybody and study the tape of all the key guys that are, you know, on that roster that they're coming into. And he just has that fresh set of eyes from an outside perspective. So if Isaiah Simmons is now being used more as a chess piece when it comes to pass coverage and a blitzer, then he's still that same chess piece that he was labeled when he first came into the league. It's just more of a two-dimensional chess piece than, you know, three or four D chess piece. And that's okay. If he's just a guy who covers a lot of ground and pass coverage and blitzes effectively, then you know what he is and you use him as such. And I think that's what's going to happen with Isaiah Simmons moving forward. Bobby's not here to defend himself, but I do think Bobby is more that guy. Like he loves those kind of linebackers. Mm -hmm. I don't. But I will say that like when we had the all 22 draft that year, I had picked 10 and I thought it was really good value. So I took him and it was like nothing but disappointment, right? Like it was just, it was bad. Um, you still have him? No, God, no. Nah. <laughs> um, but I do think that there's like opportunity for him to be su successful now. I just worry that that team is so bad that it's just going to be everybody's bad, right? Like it's like, there's, there's not going to be a lot of players that were like, yeah, he was a stud, like glad I had him on my team. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it's uh, as good of a pick as any. And my note here is kind of similar to what I said last week, which is like, this is a team that I gener generally am going to stay away from. I'm going to try to not draft Cardinals players. I'm going to try not to draft Raiders players for the same reason, right? And I talked about how this is a coaching situation that I think is temporary. I know this is the coach's first year at the team, but I think that they hired him literally just to be an interim coach while they kind of go through this transition period, they're probably going to keep Kyler out for longer than they should. And they're going to just try to get the number one pick. Um, new coach means new players. Another new coach means more new players, right? They, they like their guys. So I have a really hard time saying like, there's any player on this team that I feel really confident about being a hidden gem. Cause even I think about like James Robinson a few years ago, like even if they step in and do well, if a new coach comes into the situation, like there's a good chance, like you're just not his guy. Um, but Clayton Toon is, in my opinion, a pretty obvious choice just because there's not that many fifth round pick quarterbacks that get an opportunity to start in the NFL. And I think he's probably going to get that opportunity, which is pretty cool. But he's going to be stepping into one of the hardest quarterback positions in the NFL, right? It's, it's going to be a really bad offensive line. Your number one receiver is Marquise Brown and basically nothing else besides him. Um, and he's a pocket passer which means that he's not a guy that's going to win with his legs. He's not going to create opportunities for himself. He kind of needs the situation around him to be decent for him to be successful. I do think that he has a really nice like deep ball, which could pair well with Marquise Brown. Um, and there's a lot of big play potential, but a lot of big play potential means that there's probably going to be a lot of turnovers as well. So I'm not sure what to expect, but I think if there was anybody on this team, I'm going to take a shot on. It's a really cheap quarterback that I could get probably off of waivers that I could just keep on my depth chart, right? And what happens if he surprises? Imagine he goes out there and just absolutely crushes it. And he, you know, he's Brock Purdy next year and he gets the job. Then they have two first round picks in the top 10, right? That's kind of what they're anticipating. They go get Marvin Harrison. They go get another offensive tackle. And all of a sudden that situation is incredible. Do I think that's going to happen? Absolutely not. I think they're going to probably get Caleb Williams and ship out Kyler Murray and Clayton Toon will be, you know, a four year backup. But I don't know. It's it to me. It's a shot worth taking. As an all twenty two user, I try to take certain things from certain NFL teams that I like about their strategy and overall roster construction, and use it on my own. And then there are teams that I really just try to stay away from based on how they built their roster. But if there is one thing to take away from the Arizona Cardinals, 
it's if 12 months from now on your all 22 team, you can have Paris Johnson and Caleb Williams, you're off to a heck of a start. And then you can do your own thing from there and maybe not want to emulate them too much outside of that. But that's a heck of a start. And so far, I, I did get Paris Johnson in our rookie draft. So I'm halfway there. I think we would have said the same thing a few years ago, though, right? Like when they drafted Josh Rosen, it didn't work. And we're like, wow, these guys are brave. They're going to ship him out and they're going to draft Kyler Murray first overall. Like smart. They did, the, they did the right thing, right? But now we're sitting here like a few years later and it's like they literally took Cliff Kingsbury and just drafted him receiver at every important pick for like three years and none of the receivers worked. And it's like, I just have a hard Some time. Some teams are bad at drafting, Chris. Some teams are bad at drafting, but I know I've seen you. I've seen you play all twenty-two. Some, some guys are deodorant, and Caleb Williams is deodorant. He, you know, he he overcomes the stench of everything around him. He's that guy. He's deodorant. Somebody, uh, yeah, I heard that his. shot. So don't, uh, yeah, <laughs> don't don't even try it. All right, uh, you want to kick off the Rams? Sure. So the Rams. I'm going with slot corner Kobe Durant and it's a bit of a small sample size from 2022 because he had less than 300 snaps, but the large majority of those snaps came over the last six games of the 2022 season. And he's likely the slot corner for the Rams this year, moving forward. And last year he allowed a 48.7 passer rating from the slot, which is absolutely phenomenal. He also led the league in interception yards So he's a bit of a playmaker. He was drafted in the fourth round out of South Carolina State. So it's definitely boom or bust when you consider his sample size and his draft pedigree. But the roster in in LA overall is just pretty barren, right? So he can cement a large role for himself as a young sort of mainstay in that defense for several years if he carries over that performance into this year as well. So I think if he does that, that's a big pickup for someone who's likely... Uh, you know, Kobe Durant is off the radar for a lot of users. So if he does solidify that role for himself as a slot corner, I don't think he's getting replaced anytime soon. And if he proves that that fits his skill set well, that's a good piece to have in your cornerback room for years to come because he showed playmaking ability. He showed just coverage ability overall as far as just being sticky to opposing receivers. And there's a lot of other areas on that team that they're going to need to address in the coming years. So he has an opportunity to really solidify himself for the next half decade. That's a good pick, man. It's a good pick. And I'm happy that you said that he's going to be the slot corner and not Trey Tomlinson because Trey Tomlinson is built for the outside and he is going to be an outside corner. And I'm going to love watching him be the outside corner, but it'll be cool to see those guys kind of grow together. So it's a fun pick. You love the short guys, huh? I do. I love them. Uh, my guy is really one of my like day one dudes, uh, Van Jefferson. I, I, have been rooting for Van Jefferson for a few years now, and it just hasn't really like clicked yet. And a lot of that is because there's been injuries and there's been other stars in this situation, but this is a team now that lost a lot of its star power, but it still has Stafford. It still has Cooper cup and it still has Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson is in a contract year. And after having a few years with like injury stuff happen, I think this is when he's going to step up and prove that he is probably the number one receiver there when Cooper cup leaves because ultimately Cooper Cup is, you know, turning 30 years old and isn't going to be able to play forever, right? So it's probably going to happen pretty soon. I think Jefferson has the mature route running that is at the top level of some of the best receivers in the NFL. It's just that he lacks a lot of the elite athleticism that those top receivers have, right? When you look at guys like um AJ Brown, right? And uh Stefan Diggs, like they either have speed, they have size, They have all of these different things that really help them. I don't think Van Jefferson has that. But one thing he does have is he has Cooper Cup to kind of model his game off of and really help him just, you know, work on his craft, which is route running. And I think that that's going to set him apart uh, in the Rams offense going forward. So it's something I like and it's something I've been following a long time. And again, in year four of his contract and when it's make or break time, I think he's going to step up and be a really talented receiver there this year. Man, you just a lot of people. If they said any wide receiver on that team is going to step up, it's going to be Puka Nakua, and you're going the other side of that bet with with Van Jefferson. So that's that's an interesting pick. Uh, wasn't sure where you're going to go with that one, but I've one thing about Van Jefferson that's always kind of is the lack of athleticism. You mentioned it, right? But 
he also, his father was a wide receiver coach, I think in college and in the NFL. And that's one of those deals mm-hmm. where was he maxed out when he entered the league and is he what he is, you know, whether he's 23 years old or now 27 years old with four years in the league. I'm, I'm just not sure. And no. so, okay, we'll, we'll see. A lot of people are hyping up Puka Nakua. So it's, I mean, you're, you, you know, you, you go on Twitter with this take and, and people are going to come after you. So, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying a lot of people are going to say you're you're mistaken. But you could be right. He could be that solid veteran, not superstar, just run a good route, you know, get your first down on third and six and kind of keep things moving, not break the game open. But is that guy you need in your in your receiver room? I could totally see it. Um, and again, we are talking sleeper, not superstar. So exactly. And when and it. when you're talking about all 22 Receiver is one of the deepest positions in the NFL, right? So it's it's a position I typically like to wait on. I don't like to chase the stars. I like to wait and get a few really talented guys. And I think Van Jefferson is just that, right? Like when you're a route runner and you play the game like he does, you're going to grade out pretty well. Like you're not, you, again, you're not going to be a superstar. You're not going to get 80s, 90s grades. But you, could, you could end up around that high 70s grades every week. And that's really good. Okay. All right, kick us off with the Seahawks. Actually, no, I take it back. Because for the Seahawks, I literally just wrote down, let's just talk crazy talk about our love for Abraham Lucas. So I have a bunch of notes on just Abraham Lucas, and I'm sure you could just back it up with me. Uh, go for it because I, yes, go for it. That's that's what All we're right. going to do. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. And if you don't know Abraham Lucas by now, you should, because he was the third round pick from the Seahawks last year who started day one at right tackle across from Charles Cross. So they have two rookie tackles. One's a first round pick, one's a third round pick. And the spotlight was kind of on Cross, but the guy that really uh, shined brighter was Lucas. And uh, there was an eight week span where he ended up with over 60 grading on every single week as a rookie third round pick tackle. And then in week 18, he actually finished with an 82.9 grade that week, which is absolutely crazy, again, for a third round right tackle that's meant to start game one. And uh, something you'll kind of notice with rookies, right, is the season in college is a lot shorter. So when they have to play a full year, you'll see like the beginning, maybe like eight to 10 weeks, they start doing well. You know, maybe the first few weeks are tough, but then they kind of get it together and those next few weeks are really good. But towards the end of the season, you see them start to get burnt out. So to see Lucas end the year with an 82.9 grade is like, it's really special, right? And uh, like his size, right? You talk about size. He's 6'6", 315 pounds. It's exactly what you want from your tackle. But besides that, he's one of the strongest guys I've seen play tackle. And he has one of the best punches I've seen at a guy who plays tackle. But my favorite aspect about his game is the control he has within his frame, right? I talked about earlier Paris Johnson. That's something that I saw with him in college but was missing when he switched to right tackle in the NFL. Lucas shows some of the best body control from a rookie tackle that I've ever seen. He rarely misses when he shoots his hands. He is a patient blocker, right? He anticipates moves, lets the guys wear themselves out like as if they're, you know, it's a boxer in a match, right? Let the guy wear himself out with his spin move. And I'm going to let him do that. And then I'm going to let him come to me and right when he's done doing what he's doing and dancing. I'm going to hit him. And that's what Lucas does. Um, he's one of the most technically sound tackles I've seen as a rookie. So I'm really excited about him. Ray, I know you love him also. So you talk about him now. Yeah, Abraham Lucas. So this is he went to Washington State, right? Played college football. It was at Pullman, Washington. So they were on Pac-12 after dark, like ten o'clock at night, Eastern Time, every Saturday. You hardly ever watched him unless I don't know if you you have no kids that are keeping you up and and all that other fun stuff. But uh, we were watching the combine, right? And, and people tell you, oh, the combine doesn't matter. It's about the tape, blah blah. blah. Tell you, you can you can learn about players watching the combine. We were watching the combine. And when Lucas was up just doing drills, we texted each other, said, this Abraham Lucas guy moves really well. He moves different from most of these other guys. This is an NFL athlete. And then he dug into his tape and it was just consistency and in control and just more control and just using his hands to control the opposing rusher and just comfort, just all around comfort. And 
he just carry that over into the NFL and with, with Seattle at right tackle, he's just same thing. He's just a comfortable player. He, he, he doesn't get put out of position very often when he does, he has good size and he can, he can sort of just guide guys past the pocket and beyond, uh, you know, the inflection point there with, with the quarterback. And so he just, he, he's just a comfortable player and does a great job, uh, overall. And it's a super valuable position. So yeah, he's a player with great flexibility, great athleticism, who just makes it look kind of easy and that's really hard to do. And that's a sign of a very good player. So, uh, I actually didn't pick him as my sleeper because I was like, this guy's so good. I'm not sure he should be a sleeper, but yeah, he's Abraham Lucas is someone who, if you're not onto him yet, you should get onto him because he's a great player or is going to be a great player. Um, a great young prospect for sure in the NFL today who just does everything well, has great balance and it's exactly what you're looking for at one of the tackle spots. So I think the Seahawks, they hit on both tackle spots last year. That's a heck of a draft uh, between Cross and and Lucas. Uh, I we could we could double the the length of this podcast episode talking about Abraham Lucas if we wanted. But basically, he's got the moving skills, he's got the size, and he proved it in year one that you know the stage is not too big for him at all, and that comfort really translated over to him over for him from college to the pros. So yeah. Um, I'm all in on Abraham Lucas. He is one of my tackles. If you want him, you got to pay me a lot for him. And I know you need a tackle. So send me a legit offer, please. Uh, and we can talk from there. But yeah, big fan of Abraham Lucas. One thing we didn't say that's an interesting point to take into consideration when we're talking about Abraham Lucas is that the Seahawks had the number five pick in this draft. And there was a lot of speculation that maybe they go Paris Johnson, right? Maybe they end up having Cross and Paris Johnson as their tackles. But if you were, you know, if you followed the Seahawks at all last year, you knew that Lucas was the best rookie they had on the team. Like this dude was incredible. So for them to pass on Paris Johnson, go ahead and take Devin Witherspoon at corner, just shows the level of commitment they have in Lucas and the amount of comfort they have in Lucas in his game. So again, I'm excited about him. If you didn't know about him, go watch a little tape on him. You're gonna you're gonna love it. You're gonna absolutely love it. You did have another guy though. So do you want to talk about the other guy? No, no, it was, it was one of those where I was stretching if it wasn't, I mean, I put down Quantre Diggs just because I feel like he's super overlooked. It's not necessarily one aspect of his game that really needs to be d discussed and really sort of honed in on. It's just a matter of a lot of people when they, when they think of the Seahawks and the safeties on the Seahawks, they think of Jamal Adams. Um, but Quandre Diggs quietly is just a quality performer with 70 plus season grades four of the last five years. So someone that, yes, he's 30 years old now, so he's probably not in your long-term plans for all 22, but overall he's a, you know, very good coverage defender, smart. Hopefully he has Jamal Adams his you know, his running mate back there back for the year, finally over there in Seattle. Um, and then that's just a sneaky, good safety tandem and probably a name that a lot of people are overlooking. Yeah, it's not a bad pick. It's not a bad pick at all. Um, but Ray, last week you were saying that we had a few weeks before kind of like the hustle and bustle of the NFL season gets here. I feel like it's here, man. We got football again tonight. There's going to be another episode of Hard Knocks for us to watch. And uh, there's we're going to be podcasting again. Like I feel like we're, might, we might already have missed the boat. We might be in it already, dude. Oh yeah, we're 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 totally in it. It's like that Mr. Krabs meme, you know, when he's like looking around and he's like, ah, I'm not like what's happened? How am I like that's it's here. Football is here. football is here. We might we might be podcasting a little more often as a result now. Uh we'll see because the season is here. Um, but uh yeah, I mean in, in all its glory, we have a, a week of preseason in the books. The Hall of Fame game was two weeks ago already, believe it or not. So most of training camps are wrapping up and it's a matter now of just getting that second preseason game out of the way. Then you have one preseason game left and then you're on to game prep. So yeah, it is coming quick and uh, going to be happier for it. That's right. And thank you everyone for tuning in. If you haven't yet, please give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at all 22 underscore PFF and leave us a review wherever you watch or listen to the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Let's go.